Welcome for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Trevor Walsh, Senior Analyst here at Citizens JMP, and I'm uh, glad to be joined by Brian Miller, EVP and CFO of Tyler Technologies to do a fireside chat, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience uh, at that uh, towards the tail end. So, Brian, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so, finished out 2023 uh, in a strong way, so con congrats on that piece. What, what makes you just kind of looking forward to the next 12 months? What's getting you excited about the business? Kind of what, what opportunities are you seeing in the, the year ahead? Yeah, we did uh, have a good finish to 2023, really for the full year. We finished uh, a little bit ahead of, of, our, of our plans for the year. And we raised our guidance through the year, and at, at the end we came in really right at the high end of our, our earnings guidance and um, pretty much achieved what we what we wanted for the year. Uh, we talked about 2023 being really a pivotal year, especially around our cloud transition. Um, during the year, we crossed over to where now SaaS revenues are greater than our license and maintenance revenues. Um, we had talked for some time about 2023 being the trough year in margins with the, the margin pressure and compression that we got from that cloud transition and really kind of uh, getting around that curve. And so in the fourth quarter, we saw margin expansion and our, our expectation for 2024 is to be back on that long-term trajectory. Um, and our, uh, our plan in, in our guidance includes pretty good margin expansion, um, maybe a little bit ahead of where we would have previously expected for 2024. Um, so a lot of excitement around those initiatives, mainly around our cloud transition that will happen in 2024. Um, we're um, moving from proprietary data centers to AWS and, and uh, expect to exit our first data center mid-year, which is in line with the, the timetable we've talked about before, and that, that is one of the margin drivers, um, really starting to move a little faster with um, flipping or migrating our on-prem customers to the cloud and, and look to see good progress on that this year as well. Great. Um, <clears throat> appreciate the good the overview. Let's maybe go uh, dig a little into the, to the flips. Um, um, obviously, a lot of questions around that on the last earnings call. Um, yeah. Do you uh, and understand, I think, about 20%, if I'm correct, as far as customers on the cloud currently, and then the 2030 vision, 75, 80% is kind of the, the, the target. Yeah, relative to our current on-prem customers. So right. if you look at our, our customer base today, sort of on a revenue equivalent basis, if you translate the current maintenance revenues into SaaS revenues, we're about 40% of our customers or our revenue base is in the cloud today, and about 60% is still on-prem. Okay. Of that 60% that's on-prem, or, or what was on-prem you know, mid-year last year when we did our investor day, um, only about 15% have been migrated to the cloud and 20% or so at the end of the year. We expect that to be in the 80, 85% range by 2030, so. Great, okay. Do, are we, do we get a little bit maybe too fixated just on the flips in and of themselves? Because I mean, it, sound, it seems like there's, there's upsell opportunity that comes with that, so maybe we kind of lose the, lose the forest of the trees a little bit. Can you yeah, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that? I think there's, there's a lot of, um, of interest around the absolute number of flips. We give that every quarter, and we give the, the dollar value or the, the contract value associated with those, and the fourth quarter is 92 flips. Um, and it's, it's not... A super precise number. We've talked. We're talking about through 2030. This this migration, we have a plan and a roadmap for every product. Every product is sort of starting out in a different place, um, with where its customer base is, where that customer base um, is in terms of acceptance of the cloud. Um, so some areas like public safety um, has been the slowest to embrace the cloud. Um, in, in a lot of places, especially rural places, they're not yet comfortable putting a 911 system in the cloud. Um, but that's changing actually kind of rapidly. Other areas like ERP, we've, we've been migrating customers for 15 years to the cloud. So each product has a roadmap and a timeline that converges on getting us to that 80, 85% by 2030. But, but there's a lot of variables around how you get there. We're very confident in getting there, but from quarter to quarter, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's not a, a number we precisely predict at the beginning of the quarter. Um, Although the number of flips in Q4 was relatively consistent with the year before, the, the dollar value, contract value was up 39%. So we're seeing more bigger customers start to move. And I'd say in general, there's still a lot of our bigger customers are still on-prem. It's a, a little bit more complicated process for them, although um, um, they have a lot of motivation to do that. Sure. That's, that's great, great color. Maybe we'll, we'll step back and just look more 
2025, 2030 targets, just kind of more more broadly, whether it's top line, yeah. margin expansion, et cetera. Where 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 do you think the the pace could accelerate, or where you kind of see upside, kind of in what you're thinking, kind of based on again finishing out 23 and looking yeah. looking forward. Yeah, so at our investor day last June, and it was the first time we'd had an investor day since 2019. So it, a lot of things had changed in the company since then, including a really big acquisition and growth in the transaction or payments business. Um, so we set um, targets and expectations midterm for 2025 and long term for 2030. Um, so, you know, a, a few months into that, at the end of the year, the progress we made in 2023 was right in line with what we expected or, or maybe slightly ahead of that. Um, on the revenue side, um, I think we're, we're tracking the way we need to with the, with the cloud initiatives that, that get us there and with the payments cross sell. Um, free cash flow is actually a little bit ahead. So um, our guidance for 2024, we talked about a 17 to 19% free cash flow margin. <clears throat> and that's the, the range we gave for 2025. So um, we're, we're a little bit ahead on the cash flow side. Uh, but really, really on track with the initiatives that are going to drive us towards those 2025 and 2030 targets. I think where there's potentially um, upside maybe is, in, especially in the longer term one, is around that transaction business. Um, one of our, the four growth pillars we talked about is, is growing that transaction business. And, and to a large extent, that takes place through cross-selling payments, um, whether it's... Uh, acquiring payments, inbound payments, or disbursements, um, but selling those solutions to our software customers. Um, with the NIC acquisition in 2023, we gained a really robust payments platform, a lot of experience um, processing um, high volume payments for state governments, and now we're looking to drive that down into our local government customer base by integrating um, that payment platform into our software solutions, things like utility billing, um, traffic court, municipal court uh, systems, parks and recreation, licensing, permitting, property taxes, all those things where we provide the back-end systems and now being able to layer payments onto that. Um, so it's a tremendous opportunity. I mean, a, a multi-billion dollar opportunity just in our customer base. Um, but we're just at the very beginning of that. So we've talked about a 10 to 13% CAGR in our transaction revenues between now and 2030. Um, but um, there's certainly upside to that um, if we're very successful as we move forward. But again, we're just at the beginning, so it's a little soon to um, to change those 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 targets. But uh, but we feel pretty good about the, the opportunity and, and how we're positioned to to take advantage of it. Great. Um, the, the the California Department of uh, the State uh, Direct deal was super interesting. How? But there's some puts and takes around kind of the the self-funded version versus just buying software. And can you maybe just what in your in your ideal mind as a CFO, what, do you want more of those types of deals, or do you want how does how does how do you see that playing out, or what's the the, the, the ideal state? I suppose. Yeah, I think it, it showed that we can take all the strengths that Tyler has and create a, a, a sort of a creative model that works for the customer. Um, so this is a deal we did in the fourth quarter. Um, it's actually the largest by, by estimated volume because by value because it's a transaction-based deal, um, but the largest deal in the company's history. Um, estimated value about $175 million over eight years. So this is a, a deal with the California State Parks um, to provide um, software solution as well as um, some services um, and um, payment processing, so all bundled together. Previously, they had multiple vendors for that. Um, Conduit was sort of a overall prime contractor. We had a little piece of software, uh, less than $3 million a year in revenues from a, a piece of their outdoor recreation software, and then Elevon was doing their payment processing. So um, as California went out to uh, look at new providers, we were able to win the contract for the whole bundle of business. Um, so... Um, and that's being funded in a sort of a self-funded model. So rather than us getting paid SaaS fees or uh, uh, um, SaaS revenues for the, the software, it's bundled into a stream of revenues that'll come from transactions, basically funded by users. So um, the users of the parks, people paying for park admission, for um, campground reservations, um, to take a tour of the Hearst Castle, all those things, there'll be um, convenience fees added to those that then come to Tyler and fund the whole solution. 
Um, so it'll all show up in transaction revenues rather than part of it being in SaaS revenues. Um, it'll be a little bit seasonal um, because the usage varies from season to season. But the margins are at least as good as they would have been in separate pieces. Um, the margins on payment processing are lower than SaaS margins, obviously, but the blended margins are at least as good as they would have been. Um, but California has budget issues, and so they preferred not to have to put a line item in their budget to fund the, the software, and, and because there are users paying fees that, that this can be uh, funded through, it, and because we have a lot of experience with that kind of a model through NIC, it gave us an opportunity to, to offer a solution that, that works for their funding, works for us. I don't see a lot of deals like this um, happening. Um, we've done a couple in parks. We actually did one with the Wyoming State Parks as well but on, a, on a much smaller scale. Um, but uh, um, I think generally, uh, not every application has a, a set of users that are paying fees that can, can uh, fund, fund this sort of a, a software deal. But um, it's a great combination because we have such a strength in payment processing as well as industry leading outdoor recreation software that we're able to bundle that and bring that whole thing into Tyler at 20 plus million dollars a year in revenues. Great. Um, why don't we maybe go from the more more long term view to the more more narrow or more shorter term view of, uh, of 24. <laughs> um, you put out guidance in 24 for 24 at least from on the from the top line um, that was you know ahead of where expectations mm -hmm. were which is great um, but I, and I know you don't guide to necessarily quarterly um, type of numbers but can you help us just understand or walk us through the progression for both the revenue and uh, and earnings or profitability metrics kind of how that looks throughout uh, the next yeah. especially given some of the dynamics that you've got yeah with. sure happy to do that because it's it's not linear through the years we have or through the year we have a few things that um, um, that affect that and, and want investors to understand kind of how that progression looks. Um, so on the revenue side, the second half is, is a little bit stronger than the first half. It's, it's not um, super seasonal. The, the software continues to grow through the year. Transactions are, and we've talked about this quite a bit as, since we've added the NIC business, transaction revenues are typically lighter in the second half of the year, especially in the fourth quarter. Fewer business days, holidays affect people making payments or, or conducting business with governments. So, and, and there are a lot of sort of statutory deadlines and tax filings earlier in the year that drive those volumes up. So on a total revenue basis, I think um, it's probably like a 49% in the first half, 51 in the second half. So a little bit more heavily weighted to the second half of the year. But within the revenues, SaaS revenues, um, you should expect to see those grow sequentially each quarter through the year. So up in Q1 from Q4 of 23 and then growing sequentially, maybe call it $10 million a quarter. On the transaction revenues, they'll grow sequentially um, in Q1 and Q2, flattish in Q3, and then um, they decline in Q4, which is a normal seasonal pattern. Um, and um, that's kind of sequential growth. Compared to last year, so year-over-year -year growth, transaction revenues are going to be um, flat to down slightly in the first half of the year. And that's really a reflection of one of our state enterprise contracts, we've talked about this quite a bit last year as well, um, changed from a gross to net model on their payments. So same business, but rather than us uh, being responsible for merchant fees and including those both in revenues and cost of revenues, those um, have moved to a net model. Um, so, um, and that happened mid-year next year, last year. So that impacts the first half of this year until we lap that. And so you kind of see flat to down on transaction revenues in the <laughs> first half of the year because of the, the change in merchant fees. And then, you know, roughly you know, low double-digit growth um, for the second half of the year. You know, probably high single and then low double-digit in the last two quarters. Um, so that's the revenue side. And then on the EPS side, our guidance is, is $8.90 to $9.10. It's more heavily weighted towards the second half of the year. So on the total EPS, it's probably 45, 46% in the first half and, and 54, 55% in the second half of the year. Um, from a sequential basis, I think EPS grows modestly in Q1 compared to Q4. Um, it steps up more in Q2, and then it steps up again in Q3 and is relatively even in Q3 and Q4. Um, really that, second half um, um, 
step up is, is more focused around the, the margin improvement we get from cloud, especially as we exit our first data center mid-year. So we'll start to see the, those fixed costs around that data center go away in the second half. And also we see more impact of, of the timing of um, flips from on-prem from, um, on customers over the last few quarters um, now starting to, to kick in. And, um, and to some extent, the California contract kicking in. So a um, little bit of uh, back end weighted towards the year, but overall, um, you know, I think the midpoint of our guidance implies 70-ish um, uh, basis points of margin improvement, which is um, on track with uh, um, what we've talked about in the past. Awesome, thanks for that additional uh, kind of perspective leading us through the year. Is, is there, uh, just by the way, is the AWS partnership in, impacting at all uh, any of that uh, yeah. kind of? I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that our, our margins are maybe a, a little bit ahead of, of where we would have thought going into the year. Um, AWS is our primary um, public cloud provider. We entered into our first agreement with them back in 2019 when we really sort of accelerated the shift from being a, a, a cloud neutral or a cloud agnostic business selling both licenses and SaaS. Um, to really focusing on SaaS. And we've gone from 2019, half of our new business was SaaS and half was licensed to today, it's about 90% SaaS. Um, and so we've been migrating customers out of our data centers, um, which we used to host our, our SaaS customers in proprietary data centers. We're moving most to AWS to get out of the data center business. We've been putting all of our new customers in, in AWS and now um, our first five-year agreement is coming up for renewal, or came up for renewal. We, we renewed it um, effective the beginning of the year. Um, and now that we've scaled quite a bit there, have a lot more, uh, you know, five years of experience and, and how that's working, we have worked um, with, with help from AWS to um, optimize our products to run more efficiently in the, in the cloud and, and particularly in AWS. And um, I've been really pleased with the efficiencies we're getting there. Our unit costs continue to come down pretty meaningfully, and, and, and uh, um, we were able to, to further lower those through this new agreement. And, uh, and we'll start to see the impact of those in, in the beginning of the year, and that'll continue to expand as, as we uh, scale up more um, in their environment. Great. Awesome. Um, just maybe one, one final piece of, on, on that note around just the, the, <clears throat> the data center exits. How, yeah. Can you just give a sense of the, the, the magnitude of, of, of kind of the CapEx, um, I don't say savings, but just yeah. the, the, when, as you exit, um, kind of what's that look like on just a nominal basis of the, you know, and then, and then does that, do those dollars shift somewhere else and to put it into the business to go towards Yeah, I mean, else? we saw a lot of that in 2023. So we made the decision back in 2019 that we were gonna move towards exiting the data center. And we had thousands of customers that were hosted in our data centers. So um, it's, it's been a, uh, um, you know, a, a roadmap and a, a complicated one to get there. Um, the first one we've, we've consistently said mid 2024 and, and uh, we're right on track to do that. Um, so as we've moved forward with that plan, we have been able to reduce the CapEx around those data centers. Obviously we're, we're trying not to put more equipment into those. Um, so in 2022, um, we spent about $5 million in data center CapEx. Prior to that, it was closer to $20 million a year. Um, and it's just uh, 23 and 24, it's around a million dollars a year. And then that goes away that, so CapEx generally have been coming down. Our, our CapEx in, um, in 2024 should be three or $4 million less than it was in 2023. Um, some of that around, we've wrapped up some projects around some facilities. And then um, going forward, CapEx should, you know, it's just sort of a normal maintenance CapEx around sure. our facilities and our, our people and it should grow, you know, in line or lower than revenue growth. Got it, okay, perfect. Um, maybe just one, one last final shot from me and then I'll open it up to, uh, to the audience. Um, how do you guys think about as the, as the broader leadership team um, kind of balancing product innovation with making sure, you know, obviously the fit with customer base but not necessarily getting too complex in any particular feature or capability and you know, pri pricing it well, et cetera. How do you guys yeah. think about that going forward? Yeah, because we exclusively serve the public sector, it's a little bit different market and different approach to things than, uh, than you'll see with private sector. Typically our customer base is not sort of looking to be on the leading edge of new technology. Um, you can kind of see that in, in the, the slowness they've had to, to embrace the cloud. 
Um, you, you see it a lot across a lot of areas. Government is very risk averse. They don't like change um, in general. Uh, they want to be more efficient. They want to provide better service to citizens, but they don't really have to because they're not, they don't have competition. So um, it kind of carries over into their, their, uh, their uh, appetite for new technology. So we're, we're usually bringing things to them before they're asking for them from us. And so we're ahead of you know, anticipating what kind of needs they'll have and how we can make their operations more efficient and, and make lives better for the citizens. Um, but then, but, but uh, you know, we're making those investments early based on, on uh, how we think we can uh, uh, get the most impact for our customers. Um, so things like AI, um, you know, there's, there's a mixed bag around how governments are, are uh, are looking at it. We, you see some that are more progressive that are um, anxious to incorporate AI in, into uh, their operations, and you see some that have flat out banned AI <laughs> in in, uh, in the government or in, in their applications. So, um, so there we're, we've got task force that are looking at um, how we can prioritize within Tyler where we make those investments in our uh, into our products. Um, where it can provide the most impact for our customers. Customers you know, and governments do a lot of things that would seem to lend themselves well, um, sort of routine tasks like processing an application for a business license um, or a building permit. You see a lot of places where there's massive backups in processing building permits. Um, we sell licensing and permitting systems, but there's still a lot of manual processing done through those, and that's one of those areas where we think um, AI could do a lot of that uh, that task. One of the advantages Tyler has is because we have such a big customer base with um, you know, close to 40,000 installations of our products across the, the country and so many um, governments using our systems. We have a tremendous amount of data that's flowing through those systems that can help, um, help shape that, uh, that machine learning. So, um, so we're being very thoughtful about it and, and prioritizing it. Um, we don't have unlimited R&D budgets, but, um, but we think we can like we have been historically be at the forefront of sort of leading our customers through that. Great, thanks for that perspective. I'll, uh, I'll hold to my promise and uh, see if there's any questions from the, from the audience. Ninety basis point impact um, embedded into the 2024 guide. Could you just talk about what factors give you the confidence that 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 it, that is the impact, and is there anything that could cause that um, to to grow or shift over over time? Yeah. So in our payment processing business, um, most of our customers are on a gross model, so we we pass through merchant fees. So we we. Uh, uh, you know, charge customers a percentage of the, the transaction, and then we pay out a significant part of that to the, the credit card um, networks in, in merchant fees. So it's both in revenues and cost of revenues. If you, and it's about $154 million in our 2024 plan, um, and it's relatively flat because of this one customer that changed from gross to net. So that piece of the revenues is not growing um, this year. So if you took that out of revenues, um, so the rest of our revenues, ex excluding those pass-through merchant fees, um, are growing much faster. So if you t that impacts or lowers our growth rate, sort of at the midpoint of our guidance, by about 90 basis points. Um, it's not a frequent occurrence. Um, this was a, 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 we don't see a lot of customers, um, an indication that a lot of customers are looking to make that change. Most customers like the, uh, to have a fixed, fixed rate with us. Uh, so we don't really see much risk around that or, or change around that. Um, merchant fees in general, if you take them out of both our revenues and our cost of sales, they also negatively impact our, our margin. So our margin would be almost, our overall operating margin would be almost 200 basis points higher, excluding the impact of merchant fees. Um, so um, it's significant both to, to margins and revenue, but um, just kind of passes through there. Great. That's all okay. we have time. Thank time. you, sir. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you.